You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Bors Puya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Rehana Sultan on hashtag ExMuslim Because. We'll also be talking about Raqqa never being silenced, Iranian and other refugees at the Macedonian border, the fact that the Saudi government has um, threatened to sue if you compare it with ISIS, everyone has, as well as an insane fatwa on the fact that the earth is stationary, a wonderful inspiring billboard uh, being cut down by a woman Kurdish fighter, as well as the Turkish Atheist Association calling for equal treatment for atheists. Don't go away. There are, of course, many things that have happened over the past week. I, I think one of the things that really I found very moving was this interview with um, an activist from Raqqa Will Not Be Silenced. Um, there are activists who've been highlighting the situation in, in Syria at great risk to their lives. And he talks about the fact that, you know, ISIS considers many Syrians kafirs, infidels, and then those who are fleeing are also considered ISIS by uh, many, many people. As refugees. Uh, and the yeah. refugees. And, you know, he, he talks about how, you know, when he looks at both sides, both are condemning people. Yeah. And he does say something about, you know, well, you either stop the war or you need to open your borders because, after all, we're human beings. No, absolutely. And I think the story he tells is, is very moving. Um, that despite the fact that they are constantly on the pressure, they have people inside Raqqa and, and Syria, they, they haven't given up and they're continuing to um, show the real life of Syrians and how they've been sort of effectively civilians have been destroyed both by ISIS on one hand and and the fact that all Syrians have been labelled as, uh, as terrorists one way or another even when they seek um, refuge abroad. Yeah, I think we should show uh, a small clip of this interview because it's really very wonderful. Stay with us. Our co-founder, the sister, his father, they told him, if you, wanna to if you want us to release your father, give us three reporters. He refused. And they did two videos. They tied them to, to a tree. Then they executed him in two videos. But we decided also not to stop. They tried a lot, a lot to find our reporters on the ground. Uh, they couldn't catch them or find them. So they sent a guy to Turkey. There they behead two of our friends. One of them was working with us. Even not by fire shot, they beheaded them. Even Turkey. We thought we are safe in Turkey. But unfortunately it wasn't. That was a fantastic video, wasn't it? Absolutely. I think the key issue is while the war is going on, and I think many people are trying to sort of find a solution to this one way or another, but the reality is that while the war is going on, we must protect uh, civilians in, by all means possible, and one of those is to keep the borders open. Yeah, definitely. And of course, this is uh, not just an issue with regards Syrian refugees, because let's also not forget the many other refugees that are fleeing and trying to save their lives. There are some heart-wrenching photos of Iranian refugees at the Macedonian border, as well as others, you know, holding up signs. Uh, they've sewn their lips, which is just, you know, um, um, you know, just shows their desperation, really. Uh, but they've held up signs saying that we want freedom, too. And I think this is the story of refugees across the world. And, and particularly people who are running away from um, Islamic sort of uh, terrorist groups and Islamic governments from yeah. across and, the And war as well. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And of course, uh, we know that um, there's um, real rights violations. That is the reason why many people are fleeing. If we look at Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, it's a great example of, you know, another ISIS. It is 
similar to ISIS. But of course, the Saudi government has said that they are going to sue anyone that likens them to ISIS. On, on Twitter, they've said on specifically Twitter, about... And I think we should just do it anywhere and everywhere yeah, we can. Absolutely. I think they're trying to threaten organization, international organization, human rights organizations, and anybody to bully people into silence. Um, and we know that a lot of the um, ISIS uh, inspiration has been from Saudi version of uh, Islam. Um, at the same time, the, when you compare ex what ISIS is doing in Syria and Iraq, you compare exactly what the Saudi government does in Saudi Arabia, <coughs> and to fair. some extent, you know, the, uh, the other side of the Islamic terrorist groups, like Iranian regime, they do they're exactly the same. So, you know, by threatening people, don't compare us, is not going to take the thing away, the, well, stop, the, the problem. Stop doing things that make yes. you comparable, really. Yes. I mean, it's interesting because someone on Twitter said, well, there is a difference between ISIS and the Saudi regime. One of them sues you if you mention it on Twitter. The other just goes okay. ahead, you know. And blows you um, up, yes. But just a, a couple of cases that I think we need to highlight. One is of the 35-year-old Palestinian poet, Asha Fayyad. He's been sentenced to death uh, for apostasy. And also there is an unnamed Sri Lankan woman. She's a young woman. I'm trying to say, I don't think her age is here, but she has been sentenced to death by stoning for fornication. And these are cases that we need to highlight further and put pressure and on. And this, this shows that the uh, Saudi government is exactly the same as ISIS, as how is, no it behaves. Difference, no difference. No difference. The insane fatwa of the week is from our good friend, the Mufti Abdulaziz Ben Baz. We basically uh, wouldn't know what to do without him. He constantly churns out the stupid fatwas. We, 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 <laughs> all fatwas are generally stupid, but, he's, but he's, his is he's, the stupidest, he's, stupidest, stupidest fatwas ever. Yeah, he, he, and his the new guy one, is gold. <laughs> Gold, Jerry. <laughs> the, the new one is about <laughs> the fact that he says if the, you the think earth is that the earth isn't stationary, you are a kafir. That means the earth is stationary and sun revolves around <laughs> the earth. I think he's the only one who believes in this. It doesn't matter. <laughs> people go to Mars. These the, the people have been to Moon. These photographs. This evidence every day. Plane goes. Everybody sees that the universe is something else. This mm. guy, it's quite persistent in his views. And I think he's the only one. <laughs> Just who won't give up. And he's deputy of some sort of univer Islamic university in Saudi Just Arabia. Don't go to that university. All right? Don't say this because Saudi Arabia may sue you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was funny because uh, Reza was saying the story about. Uh, a teacher who had, you know, who was talking about a chapter in the book which talks about how the earth isn't flat and so on and so forth. And when, obviously, when pictures came of the earth from outer space, they realized, he said, well, you've got the picture now, you don't need to read this chapter anymore. And I think Some, someone needs to show this guy a couple of pictures and he's still yes. not going to believe it. No, no, no. He's, he's carry on. Yeah. He's an idiot. <laughs> Earlier this week, we did an interview with Rehana Sultan on the hashtag ExMuslim because what it was about, what it wanted to achieve, and why it's so important. Listen to this interview. Welcome, Rehana, to the program. I wanted to ask you about the ExMuslim because hashtag. I mean, it was something that you, it was your idea that you brought to the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. Tell us on an emotional and, and on an intellectual level why you felt it was necessary to have this hashtag. Um, the main reason I, pr I proposed the hashtag because we have a growing community of ex-Muslims uh, who do not want to affiliate with Islam, the Quran or the Prophet any, a, anymore and they are unable to criticize or even come out to their community publicly because any criticism of Islam is confused as being criticism of Muslim. And at that moment, I mean, you're at a risk of being arrested as being uh, on, on hate crime. You don't, if, you, if you're an activist, you don't get, get in, you get disinvited from universities to talk on important issues. And even in workplaces, I mean, if you are uh, um, um, an ex-Christian, uh, no one would care. But if you're an ex-Muslim, it becomes very controversial because people think you're an anti-Muslim. And right now is the time to actually separate this separate the criticism of idea from the criticism of people because we are trying to tell the world that criticizing Islam is not the same as criticizing Muslim. 
the same way criticizing um, some the Torah or the, or, or the, or the Leviticus or the Deuteronomy is the same as cr uh, criticizing Jews or Christian. Why, though, is it important to say that someone is an ex-Muslim? Why can't they just, you know, call themselves an atheist and just carry on with their lives? Because it's basic human rights and because any individual should be able to exercise the free speech to, to express their opinion without being dumbed down by any political group that will try to use this paint them as a racist or as an anti-Muslim. This is just basic human rights. I am not born in a Christian family. I wasn't born in a Hindu family. I was born in a Muslim family. I left Islam. I no longer identify myself as a Muslim because the definition of Muslim is a person who follows Allah uh, takes Quran as the perfect word of Allah and follows Muhammad as the perfect lifestyle guy, mentor. I do not follow Allah. There is there is no way I agree with the Quran in most ways. There is no way I think Muhammad was um, you know a worthy man of following. Uh, so there is no reason for me to call myself a Muslim. That makes me an ex-Muslim. There is there is no way within that definition. I hate my Muslim family or my Muslim friends. And the people, the larger community, has to understand that because um, I am I am discriminated. I, I I I am bullied on social media in in my in my in my real life, saying I am an anti-Muslim because I am an ex-Muslim. And I think that is that is what real bigotry is like. The bigotry. real bigotry is. Yeah. So yes. And were you surprised by the sort of level of, uh, you know, support and this hashtag just trended, didn't it? And it went crazy off the charts. Yes, it happened because we weren't even halfway through promoting the campaign. We just because we, we we thought it would be very unpopular and people wouldn't come out because they would be very scared. So we decided to roll out the campaign very slowly and then snowball it, and then do everything on the tenth of December, which is the Human Rights Day. But I think within two or three hours, the hashtag picked up and the the responses I've received was overwhelming. I I, I became very emotional because. Uh, very ordinary people have very extraordinary experiences in their life because of how they believe and how they want to cope. They want to be a part of the community within, without even struggling with the internal beliefs about the world. And it was just heartbreaking. I, I cried on se several instances when I, when I read about uh, a woman who was ostracized by her family because she married a Christian. Then there was a woman who, who, whose father told her that if you are raped within your marriage, that's not rape because of whatever he believes within his Islamic. And those are just heartbreaking. heartbreaking. So that was just really sad. I mean, it was interesting because you did hear people saying on this hashtag that it was uh, some of the best moments of their life. Yes. And the fact that they were able to speak. Yes. Tell, tell me some more of the funny and other things. What did you put yourself I in? I said, I was more, I think, more comical because, yeah. I said, I, I'm an ex-Muslim because there, there are no 72 versions for me. That's just unfair. It's just... Within Islam, you say that a, a man can have as many sexual partners as possible. You can take sex slaves during Muhammad's time. But whenever a woman has more than one partner, she's, she's like slut shamed. And no, that's just double standard. So I was trying to make a point. It's not that I want 72 virgins, so I, I won't be able to cope with it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what do you think is um, the next steps, basically? Well, uh, my initial aim was to actually just wake up, wake people up that, you know, we, are, we exist, just, you know, uh, we need to talk about some things. But we, what I was very much moved by the way people have actually reached out to us. They don't care about their, you know, they're not worried about their life, their safety, but there are people hiding behind, hiding their faces, but still telling the truth. I think that, that is what true courage is. And I think um, my long-term plan would be to actually, I, I would keep the official Twitter account of the ex-Muslim because so that I can reach out to as many ex-Muslims as possible. But I would, I, I would work towards empowering and mobilizing ex-Muslims around the world so they can actually uh, take care of themselves and find ways to actually contribute to their community to promote free speech and secularism. It's very dangerous right now. We won't do it now, but I think t in 10 years time, I think I have a dream that so many secular and liberal people from the Muslim world, I am just moved. And, yeah. and also I was very much moved to see so many Muslims supporting us. Uh, some, some fantastic Muslims have come to support us. 
And that's just amazing. That shows that we have room for dialogue and not just people eat. So, yes. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Rehana Sultan. I think she raises some really important questions. I think what's often forgotten in this debate, and which seems secondary, tertiary, whatever, and actually it's the main point, which is the fact that people should be allowed to leave Islam like they can leave Christianity, like they can leave Judaism, without being killed and without apostasy laws and threats and intimidation. This is a fundamental human right. Absolutely. And suddenly, as soon as this comes out and everybody recognizes the issue, and they start saying, shouldn't you be doing this? Should you really be doing this? That sort of approach to uh, the debate. But they want the, the thing that they don't see, and we've always insisted on this point, that there is a tsunami of uh, people leaving religion in Middle East. There is a huge secular movement in Middle East, North Africa, and uh, uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, and we could, we could see this. And this just little moment of a few days of hundreds of thousands of people coming and supporting the hashtag is just the tip of the iceberg. The reality is that the, uh, the strength of the uh, secular movement, atheist movement, uh, people who doubt about uh, religion, on, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's very it's huge, huge. Yeah. Actually, that's a dominant trend in uh, in Middle East and North but Africa. But it's not recognised. I mean, in less than a week, a hundred thousand tweets on this issue. It shows how much of an impact it's had on people. You know, Rehane talks about crying when she read some of the tweets, and there are people who've said that this was one of the most brilliant moments of their lives. It just shows how much people need to be able to say what they think and how little opportunities they have because there's immediately an accusing finger at you if you dare to criticize and, Islam and these, or... these are the mainstream media who are doing that because they don't want this. They constantly, it seems that they need the current structure, current arrangement that they have. They don't want this to, to change. They don't want people to come and express the view that they actually leave in Islam. You could see there is resistance from mainstream media. Well, and, and you can see because it's, it's hardly been covered really by uh, mainstream media given the fact that it was a trending hashtag and it continues uh, to have such a huge impact. Uh, BBC Trending has interviewed me and what I found interesting about the interview was that it was very antagonistic mm -hmm. and when I looked at their other trending things it wasn't that way. And I was either accused of, you know, promoting racism because, you know, you're, you, you, uh, Muslims are under attack after Paris, as if Paris has, Islamism has anything to do with ordinary Muslims. And when I answered that, then it became, well, now you're putting the lives of ex-Muslims at risk by telling them to come out. So it seems like I'm a worse killer than ISIS is, you know, at the, at the way they look at people like myself. Uh, absolutely. I mean, they, to say that by expressing view and creating an environment and a framework for people who do not believe in Islam or they want to leave Islam, to express the view, you put in their lives and, uh, at risk. It seems that these uh, mainstream media, including BBC, they've never exp expressed or have not, they know nothing about the history of enlightenment, for example, in Europe, that people had to break the, uh, the framework and barriers that there was uh, f for them to actually change the, the society. Yeah. And this is what is happening in Middle and, East. And, and the point I made was that obviously there's safety in numbers. The more people come out, the, the more people are allowed to question. Uh, the, the safer it will be for a lot of people. And also, it's good for Muslims as well, as well as anybody else, because the more of a space that's open for dissent, the more everyone benefits from it. And it protects everybody. Yeah, it does protect everyone. Uh, 
continue, you know, we're continuing this ex-Muslim because hashtag, um, we want to gather as many tweets and posts and photos and videos as possible for December 10th, International Human Rights Day, to show very clearly, loudly and clearly that the right to apostasy is a basic right. No ifs and buts. This week's Slice of Life is a photo that is the most inspirational thing, honestly, that I've seen in a very long time. And there are a lot of inspirational things out there. But this is a photo of, as, as you can see on the screen, of a woman, a Kurdish fighter, breaking down a poster of ISIS because they've kicked ISIS out of Sinjar. Yes, and uh, it's a poster which basically advises women to dress in body bags. It's a body bag. It's a body it's bag. Not a, it's like a borka, a niqab. You can't even see anything of the woman, nothing. And uh, she is breaking this poster with down gun. with her gun. Yes. And it's just, you know, she's also not veiled. And, you know, it's just this... The this, contrast. The contrast and the fact that, you know, it's happening in... Um, you know, in Sinjar, this is not a Western uh, demand. It is a human demand to push back ISIS, to push back misogynist views about women and to, you know, demand equality, secularism, all of the things that are really very much needed in the 21st century. And he's not anti-Muslim. And the beauty of this is that, you know, in Middle East, the, the most anti-religion, anti-Islamic region that exists, this is how people treat Islamic signs, uh, the enforcement on, on people. And unfortunately, in the West, if you do this in the West, suddenly you'll be accused of Islamophobia. Yeah. Well, I just, I just had a, a friend of uh, mine, uh, she was just recently in Kurdistan, and she was saying that, you know, a lot of the things, uh, it, when you talk to uh, the Kurdish fighters there and people living there, and when you talk about Islamophobia, they just cannot, cannot comprehend how, how this can be, you know, this fight for freedom and equality can be reduced to a sort of racism against the very people who are most affected by Islamism. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this week's program. We look forward to hearing from you. Do stay in touch with us. Until next week, we hope you have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, 
artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.